Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Shaw Zakram, and I am the uh, director of the Fulbright Association, and I'm also the uh, chair of the Embassy Dialogue Committee. Uh, we are a bit late in our uh, spring symposium, uh, but we are very delighted to be able to have such a, an amazing selection of panelists. Uh, today we will have four speakers. The first half of the program will cover the academic institutional side, and the next half of the program will cover the embassy side uh, of, of international education. Um, we are a NAFSA MIG uh, member interest group that uh, uh, collaborates with embassies and we bring together institutions and embassies in dialogue on exchange and higher educational um, priorities in the U.S. Um, our four speakers today are Dr. Peter DeCherney. He is a professor at the University of Pennsylvania. He is an author, an editor, an award-winning documentary and virtual reality filmmaker. He's also been an acad um, has also been an Academy of Motion Pictures Arts and Science Scholar, a Fellow of the American Council of Learned Societies, and a U.S. State Department Arts Envoy to Myanmar. Um, uh, our second speaker is uh, Dr. Carolyn Lavander. She's the Vice President of Global and Digital Strategy at Rice University. She oversees Rice's uh, international strategies, program development, and the coordination of international activities across the university. Um, then our, we, our two embassy uh, speakers are Marisi, uh, Marcy Schmitz. She's the Deputy Education Attaché at the Embassy of Brazil. Uh, she was a visiting scholar and served as Director of Exchange and Study Abroad Programs at Wright University. Um, she's uh, currently um, based in DC. And then we have Vera Buitin from the um, Embassy of the Federal Republic of Germany. She's a Fulbright Scholar, one of ours, um, and uh, she uh, currently focuses on the North American Regional Science and Cultural Anthropology and Psychology um, at the University of, of, in Bonn. She also received a Fulbright Scholarship to go to the University of Mexico. Um, she was also Deputy Head of the Middle East Division at the Foreign Office and Head of the Yemen Team. So welcome to all our speakers. I'm gonna turn it over to Peter uh, and we shall start our program. Thank you. Thank you, Shaz. Hi, everyone. Um, so let me give you a little background about the uh, University of Pennsylvania first. Um, so where, where I direct the university-wide online learning initiative. Um, over the last decade, we've created about 200 open online courses with tens of millions of enrollments. We've created seven fully online degrees, including two doctoral programs and the first Ivy League bachelor's degree. We have about 1,500 students who are studying entirely online. Um, and that was all happening pre-pandemic. Uh, and so even before the pandemic, we were thinking about how to make all of these online students feel like members of the Penn community and how to support them. Uh, Penn education isn't just about the quality of the education, it's about all the effort we put into helping students succeed. So when we moved everything online uh, in spring of 2020 during spring break, um, we already had this uh, sort of background to draw on. Um, so as, as I said, you know, during spring break 2020, we brought all of our courses online and most of the university activities. In the fall, we had only had a few hundred students living on campus. Most of the instruction was on, all the instruction was online. Uh, and then in the spring, we had a few thousand students, but still most students were remote at work learning from home and most activities were online. Um, there was still some clinical education in the health science schools, which was in person. And in the mid middle of the fall semester, the law school transitioned to something we call high flex. So some students were in the classroom, some students were home, some faculty were in the classroom, some were home, complicated, but actually they did it very successfully. Uh, so the challenge was how to scale online teaching, student support, and the community building. Um, and of course, uh, trying to accommodate international students um, and support international students uh, complicated all of those areas. Uh, so I'll just say this was a time of hardship and deprivation for everyone, for faculty and students. I know everyone's just exhausted after three semesters of teaching during the pandemic. But um, from my perspective, it was also a time of reflection on pedagogy and on the function of the university. Uh, and there was also a time for innovation. 
And ultimately, I think we're going to come out of this uh, with an, uh, a lot of information and experience that will help improve the future of higher education. Uh, whatever we do, there's, there's no going back to the way things were before. Um, certainly, some of the, um, the issues were about access and connectivity, just very the most basic elements of, of learning online. And we did things like give grants to students. Uh, and also, we learned a lot about how to reduce the technical demands on students, uh, to having to do doing things more asynchronously, making material downloadable, even doing things just in audio when that made sense. And then, of course, time zones and trying to accommodate students uh, in different time zones was something that individual faculty members thought a lot about, that the university thought a lot about. The School of Arts and Sciences adopted a new scheduling system to try to spread out courses. Uh, and we did a lot of things twice. We taught course sections twice. We had events twice. We had um, advising sessions uh, twice or three times. Um, so in the end, um, lots of these courses and programs ended up being more inclusive than they were before, globally inclusive, and I think that kind of accessibility is going to continue post-pandemic. So just to give you a few individual examples of, of things that we did over the last year, uh, and then happy to answer broader questions later. So one is we advocated very strongly for students and gave just incredible personal attention. Uh, Penn President Amy Gutman really led the way in the advocacy side with very strong statements in support of international students. Uh, and that led to our offices communicating with congressional delegations. We collaborated with other universities and associations. Um, we joined uh, Rice and other uh, universities in filing an amicus brief, which challenged the Trump administration's policy revoking F-1 visas for students who are learning entirely online. Also in response, we held classes online, in person rather, for, um, for international students. Um, the Penn Global and Regulatory Affairs worked with individual students on visa issues and, and whatever individual issues they had. And we had many, many information sessions, not just about the constantly changing policies, but about managing the emotional and cultural demands of studying abroad and online. So a second thing we did, um, well, so those were two, I guess. One was uh, get advocacy, and the second was individual attention around policy. Um, a second thing we did was just pivot um, all of the uh, established programs we had and bring them online. So for instance, in, um, in July, we had over 60 students take place uh, in a for, something called Forerunner Global. Um, it was a, it's a program for international students preparing to study in the US and specifically at Penn. So pre-pandemic, we only held that in Beijing and New Delhi. Uh, now it was held online and that will definitely continue and was able to include um, learners, as I mentioned, from 58 additional countries. But really, uh, we didn't just pivot things online. We also rethought many of the activities we did, just teaching and support and community, and try to reimagine them from the ground up as online learning, um, as, as online activities. Uh, so our College House system and the Penn Global Office, for example, helped plan social activities for student groups. Uh, one that ended up being really successful, that, that was great, was a, a kind of uh, speed networking um, platform called Glimpse, which students filled out surveys and they would match them up and they would talk for seven minutes or so and then move to another, uh, another student, really trying to approximate the kind of serendipitous experience you would have just walking along uh, a campus uh, hallway or, or sitting in a cafe. Um, much of the real innovation came from the students themselves. We have an organization called the Assembly of International Students, which is an umbrella organization for 30 cultural organizations. And they did more programming, community building than ever. They were involved in advocacy, both on campus and around policy issues. And they even led their own undergraduate orientation uh, to help international students um, prepare to, to learn and study online or, or on campus if they were coming to campus. Uh, one, thing they did, one thing they did really well was to have a virtual club fair. So something we do every fall is that students will walk along the main drag on campus called Locust Walk. There are tables out there where um, the, the student paper, the Daily Pennsylvanian and clubs will, will uh, try to bring students in and talk about what they do. And um, we, they've been planning an online version of this for over a year before the pandemic, but it, um, you know, it, it really was a sort of uh, got to, was tested during the pandemic and was really successful. Um, the, uh, the metrics about um, student engagement were just off the charts. Many more students participate in this even than would in person. Um, there's also a lot of innovation around studying abroad. So we have a program called Penn Global Seminars, uh, and they're semester-long courses in which students will do a two or three week abroad, short study abroad program as part of the, coming out of that. They're all very different. They're different disciplines. They're offered by all 12 schools at Penn. 
Uh, and so each one was a little different uh, in the way they addressed the challenge of trying to do things uh, globally while, while students were mostly at home. Um, they turned into something called Collaborative Online International Learning or COIL courses. We love acronyms. Um, you know, if you hear a conversation around among PAN administrators, it would just often seem like gibberish because there's so many acronyms being thrown around. And uh, so some courses would bring in speakers, um, uh, and which they could have done before, but, but you know, we all have so much more facility um, using Zoom and other platforms that it was easy to bring speakers in. Um, they would engage with students studying at other universities in other countries and have experiences that way. And also um, something that wouldn't happen if we were on campus is if it were possible, students did different kinds of field work and then they could compare field work that was being done simultaneously in different countries. Um, also our study abroad program, which is normally a semester or a year long program or summer long program, turned into something entirely new, um, and it was entirely uh, revolved around uh, offering internships for students uh, so that students could work globally, um, remotely uh, during, during the school year. Um, one of the more interesting programs for study abroad came out of the law school. Uh, the law school already had a lot of um, partnerships with law schools around the world, and they drew on those to create a kind of um, exchange program, uh, one with a university in Hong Kong, one with one in Israel, and increasingly they'll add others. So that students studying at Penn could take three courses, for example, at Penn Law School and one in Hong Kong. So it was almost a kind of semester, it was a study abroad program um, baked right into a semester program and it doesn't have to be all or nothing, they could combine them. So these are all really exciting things that could have happened before, but just would have been impossible really without the provocation of the, uh, of the pandemic. Um, and then finally, I'll just give an example of something. Uh, Carolyn's heard about this way too much, and I apologize if you hear about it again. But um, something, something I was thinking about for a long time before the pandemic, uh, and then the provost said, let's get this up and running really quickly. Uh, something we call a hub at Penn. It's a platform that we built so that st for student services. As I mentioned, helping students succeed is a really important part of a Penn education. Um, and this was a way to, to use the internet to do it, but um, I actually think it, it can solve student, help students solve problems much more efficiently and effectively than we can with the offices that we already have. So uh, you, it, it's a platform you go in like Google and you would type in your problem. And so maybe your problem is that you're failing a course. Uh, we actually don't have an office for people failing courses. Uh, there are a lot of reasons you could be failing a course, uh, but you might, and you might go to, um, to you know, to an office that offers advising, uh, or or you might go to another kind of student service office uh, for the tutoring, or account student counseling, or time management. Right, we have all these different offices, um, and uh, but uh, sometimes you bounce around or you need multiple offices. This is a way of kind of starting with the problem and then um, finding all the resources. And so university offices, uh, really across the university, were great about not just putting their own, their information online but helping to build out a knowledge base so the students because even start to get answers before they reach out to someone. Uh, and we're working on, on improving this um, over the so summer as well. We've been having, uh, it's been interesting to kind of think through the various routes a student might take through this. Uh, so what are some of the lessons, the takeaways? Um, I think one is we're gonna do a lot more online and do it better going forward. And we're gonna do that in the service of using the time we have that's synchronous and in-person as effectively as possible because we know how, how precious and important that is. Um, something else that I think we've learned uh, is that um, education is holistic, uh, that our lives, the lives of faculty and students are just really important part of the learning process. Things that are happening culturally and, and socially are really important. Things that are happening physiologically are really important to what happens. Carolyn and I wrote about this back in April 2020, the beginning of the pandemic, in an article in Inside Higher Ed called um, Online Learning Will Make Us More Human. But I actually think it's it's, it's turned out to be something we've learned even more than Carol and I could have predicted. Um, and then finally, I think we've all been kind of learning and innovating in our own corners and thinking about our own courses or our own offices or, in, and our, or institutions. And, um, and I hope what's gonna happen uh, over the summer is that people will rest, but then in the fall, we'll start to really talk about this much more uh, through conferences and other events and figure out how we take all the various uh, in, in discrete things we've learned and bring them together. Been happy to, to ask questions about all of those or things that I didn't even mention. 
Great. So maybe, uh, Peter, I'll go ahead and, and uh, make a few comments as well. And I don't want to reproduce many of the um, really excellent observations that Peter made about UPenn and about higher education more generally. I, I really want to commend uh, U.S. universities or many of them for teaming up and advocating for our international students who were, uh, you know, trapped in various uh, parts of the world and and really felt stranded. Um, I think that that was a, a very positive outcome of a very difficult pandemic situation. Uh, certainly, university coordination and really prioritizing our international students and community members. Um, you know, something that we just assume so much that we almost don't mention it, but is worth noting is that universities, U.S. universities uh, are very, very international uh, in their student body, in their scholar uh, demographics. Uh, Rice is probably typical uh, in that 25% of our students, undergrad, grad students are international, so non-U.S. Um, they hail from over 80 countries, so very, um, <clears throat> very wide-ranging representation around the world. In addition to those students, we've got over a thousand international scholars uh, on the Rice campus in any given day. And to make those numbers meaningful, you know, Rice is a smaller institution. We have uh, about 750 faculty full-time uh, tenure tenure track. Uh, as I said, about 8,000 students, undergrad and graduate. And so, really, I think you know, worth underscoring that international students form a very substantial percentage of our demographic, as do international faculty, international postdocs, and scholars. So we are even on ground, especially on ground, um, places that are historically quite diverse in terms of uh, region and geopolitics. Now, that, of course, is something that, as Peter has observed, digital education has really amplified and accelerated. And like Penn, uh, Rice me uh, reaches millions of learners around the world with online for credit, not for credit courses that we deliver through different platforms. It's been a wonderful way to amplify our global um, uh, priority as a university and uh, to really understand how different communities learn and, and what what the priorities in those communities are in terms of curriculum course content so that's a very powerful um, uh, source of knowledge for how we develop our curriculum and priorities as a university I would say you know like Penn uh, Rice was incredibly grateful for the years of groundwork that we had placed uh, on digital when the pandemic hit. And, you know, we had no idea when the university developed uh, guidelines, faculty senate endorsed guidelines for uh, delivering high quality online uh, courses for credit and degrees that we would suddenly, you know, within literally two years of approving those guidelines, be applying those to our entire curriculum. Um, and, you know, it is worth saying that a place like Rice, you know, we have about 2,000 courses that we deliver residentially every semester. When COVID hit, only about 20 of those were actually being delivered fully online. And so we very quickly pivoted uh, from a primarily residential uh, curriculum, delivered uh, residentially curriculum, to an entirely online delivered curriculum. I'm sure you've read much about that um, over time in pretty much every press. Uh, there were screams of pain. There were uh, a few yells of joy. Um, it was a, a remarkable phenomenon to be a part of. But in that process, we paid immense attention to the particular challenges that our international students faced. Um, and I'd like to dwell a little bit on some of those to give you a sense of it. First, we had a number of international students who were stuck on our campus. We dispersed our students very quickly, but a number of students either couldn't return home or it was really uh, impractical and, and not desirable for them to return home. And so we found many of our international students became very, very local members of our uh, teaching and learning community during COVID. And so we had to make, um, you know, accommodations as a university for continuing to teach face-to-face -face, 
uh, our international students uh, while we were teaching online to many of our domestic students. And so it's an interesting, uh, kind of an interesting set of challenges that we, that we dealt with, I think, very well. Um, now, of course, most of our international students uh, the challenges there were that they were dispersed around the world uh, and were having a very difficult time returning to campus. And let me just say, we are still um, attentive to those challenges. And in the next couple of months, we will see you know, how successful the efforts that Peter described over this last year have been in breaking down some of the barriers that our international students faced and getting the visas they needed and the travel clearance to return to campus. But in this interim period of time, we developed a series of workarounds that I'm, I'm happy to describe in a little bit more detail. One was that we partnered with WeWork uh, and developed a um, series of access paths opportunities for our students in different parts of the world. So if you are a Rice student uh, in Beijing, for example, uh, you had a WeWork access pass that would enable you to go to any WeWork location and you know you would have competent broadband, you'd have a quiet place to work um, while you were taking your courses online from Rice. And so one of the things we really wanted to make sure is that the kind of um, you know, equal learning environment that students get on campus, a dorm room, access to a library, competent internet, uh, that those basic environmental needs for education were as consistent as we could possibly make them. It was not only a challenge for students who were located around the world, it was a challenge actually for students in rural parts of the US. We had different ways of addressing uh, you know, connect internet connectivity issues uh, for students in you know the Dakotas, for example, in rural areas of uh, of the Rocky Mountains. Um, so it was it was a, a challenge that confronted many of our students, um, and and we really developed ways um, not as holistic as the WeWork passes, of course, but um, but I think equally effective. And then in addition to this idea that Rice students could access a neutral and competent, consistent workspace. Um, we understand that the need of students to form a community is remarkably important to the learning experience of students. And we probably, as Penn and many other universities, had a large number of students who were in China, unable to return to, to Texas, to the US. And so um, I, did, I partnered with a Chinese university in Shenzhen, a university by the name of SUSTEC, the Southern University of Science and Technology, to develop um, what we call a Go Local program. And you may have heard of some of these kinds of partnerships. Um, it, was, it was a real uh, good fortune that SUSTEC and Rice had a, an ongoing research relationship. A number of our faculty uh, are doing research collaborations with faculty there. I had done a site visit. Uh, with the provost and president of, of Sus, uh, to SUSTEC, the Rice Provost, Rice President to SUSTEC, uh, just you know, within a year before the pandemic occurred. And so we had goodwill to draw upon. We had about 100 Rice students who were co-located in one of the SUSTEC dorms. Um, all of them you know, were taking different online courses at Rice. Many of them were in the same classes. And so there was a sense of community and esprit de corps that developed uh, among the students if they were taking the same class, but also just because they were, they were part of a Rice community embedded in this different university context. And so that, that is a very important a way that we supported international education or education for our international students rather during the pandemic. I want to just uh, comment on a, a third pilot we ran, uh, call it the Global Scholars Program. As Peter mentioned, online education has been a powerful, um, a powerful engine for creativity and innovation. And um, you know, sure enough, a pandemic is no different. We actually uh, collaborated with HKUST, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology, um, to develop a kind of quid pro quo student exchange. And we had close to 30 HKUST students 
sitting in um, our online courses over the course of you know each semester taking a range of different classes so we opened our online courses to a you know an international student audience as a pilot to see what happens if we think about study abroad as enabled by digital of course not replacing the the real joys of you know physical relocation and immersion in a SUSTEC environment or another study abroad environment, but nonetheless, um, it's a way to see what it's like to be in a HKUST classroom or in a Rice classroom if you're an HKUST student. And so that was a wonderful experience for both communities of students. The Rice students loved um, uh, learning with uh, with students from Hong Kong, and so it was a kind of unanticipated upside of the pandemic. Um, there's many more that I could call out uh, in terms of international education opportunities and challenges we confronted, but I really want to underscore um, the, the real challenge that research has taken during the pandemic. And, um, you know, graduate students uh, have been uh, re the research trajectory, the research careers of so many of our PhD students um, have, have really been compromised. Um, I am really grateful to see, I'm getting emails from uh, students who are letting me know that they are beginning to do archival work. Uh, some are you know, flying to Europe uh, as, as different countries open to do archival work, um, but you know, that's, that's wonderful good news. We have to acknowledge the over a year that has been lost. Um, research labs closing, uh, so our graduate students, you know, just unable uh, to work in labs of colleagues around the world. It's, it's, it's a substantial setback and very important to understand for young faculty members starting their career, this is a setback that is uh, much more impactful then if your later career and you know your your career is already established and maybe you don't get to go to CERN, um, you know because of pandemic restrictions and do your research as you'd planned, but that's one year as a you know in a in a decades long career as opposed to your first year. So I do want to acknowledge that. I, I don't think there's an easy workaround there, um, but we do need to support these young scholars. Uh, and their career pathways. One way we did that at Rice, um, and I think we're not unique in this regard, we uh, certainly understand that students have lost a year, and so we made the strategic decision to actually not admit first-year students in humanities, but to extend that funding that would have gone to first-year students to support an additional year of our graduate students. And I, I think time will tell, um, you know, uh, how effective that is. It'll probably be a decade from now before we know if that decision was a was a wise one. Certainly in the moment, uh, those students that we have dissertating right now uh, were immensely grateful. Um, you know, it's not as easy in the sciences and engineering, quite frankly, when research dollars are grant related and not necessarily coming centrally from the university. And so, um, you know, there, there's not a uniform answer for all disciplines, but I do think an important thing to bear in mind. Thank you so much, Peter and Carolyn, for giving such a good institutional perspective for su sustaining international education during the pandemic. Uh, please remember to post all questions in the Q&A. Gudrun Kenden, the Director of International and Schol uh, Scholar Services at Catholic University, will be moderating the Q&A. We now turn to our embassy colleagues, Marcy and Vera, to share the international community perspective and best practices from the embassy perspective. So Marcy, floor is all yours. Thank you, Shaz. A pleasure to be here today. I have divided my presentation in three parts. First, I'd like to share some data from the 2020 Open Doors report and 2021 Open Doors Intensive English program to give you a context for Brazil. Both 
reports were produced by the Institute of International Education, IIE. Secondly, uh, I will talk about some of the actions and initiatives of the Brazilian government during the pandemic. And finally, I will provide you with some updates on initiatives and trends. According to the 2020 Open Doors report, 1,075,496 international students studied in the United States in the 2019-2020 academic year. Brazil ranks number nine in origin of international students in the U.S. 16,671 Brazilian students studied in the U.S. in the 2019-2020 academic year representing an increase of 3.8% compared to the previous year. 4,268 Brazilian scholars engage in temporary academic activities at U.S. colleges or universities during the 2019-2020 academic year. 2,269 U.S. students studied in Brazil in the 2018-2019 academic year. And according to the IIE Open Doors Intensive English Program released on June 2nd, 2021, Brazil ranks number five in leading places of origin of Intensive English Program students in 2020. 2,637 2, students participated in, in intensive English programs, representing 7.1 of total students. Just Brazil is just behind China, Saudi Arabia, and, ja and Japan. Going back to early March 2020, WHO declared COVID-19 a pandemic. U.S. universities cancel in-person classes, closed dorms, so many Brazilian students returned to Brazil. On May 24, 2020, former President Trump signed a proclamation imposing restrictions for Brazilian travelers to enter the U.S. The U.S. Embassy and consulates in Brazil suspended routine no-immigrant visa appointments so the Embassy of Brazil in Washington received hundreds of emails from students and parents. In the meantime, the Brazilian Embassy maintained regular contact with the U.S. Department of State to monitor the situation and discuss possibilities for students to be able to return to the U.S. On January 25th, 2021, President Biden signed a proclamation continuing the suspension of entry of travelers from Brazil. The Embassy of Brazil continued to provide the students with, with pertinent information. We continue to answer a high number of emails every day, reassuring students and parents that the Embassy was in constant dialogue with the U.S. Department of State. On April 26, 2021, the U.S. Department of State applied several national interest exceptions to travel restrictions related to Brazil, and they are currently in fact as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic. So students traveling from Brazil and seeking to start studies in the fall may now qualify for a national interest exception. Students who already have a valid student visa and who will begin their studies on or after August 1st, 2021, may travel to the United States without further action from the U.S. Embassy or consulates in Brazil. Amid raging COVID outbreaks in Brazil, academic institutions had to pivot, especially to advance online education. The Brazilian government is accelerating initiatives in order to respond to the new demands presented by digital transformation. There is a need to expand the population's connectivity and access to digital services. The embassy has organized webinars on digital technologies in education, 
including the participation of universities in Brazil that have advanced in online education. Now some updates on initiatives and trends. CAPES Print. CAPES Print is a program to foster the internationalization of academic programs financed by the coordination for the improvement of higher education personnel, CAPES, of the Brazilian Ministry of Education. It supports the exchange of students and faculty with research institutions in countries around the world. The program selected 36 Brazilian institutions to participate in print. The program has supported internationalization projects that started in 2019 and should be implemented in four years. We have not yet heard of a new call, but we suggest that uh, uh, universities contact their partners in Brazil to find out if they applied for the print program, if, if they are implementing a strategic internationalization plans or working on, on projects with partners abroad. The Association of International Education Administrators, AIEA, postponed an event, SIOs and Brazilian Building Partnerships under the CAPES Sprint Program at Uni Universidade Estadual Paulista, UNESP. The event was supposed to be held in April 2020. Hopefully this fall, the program will take place in Brazil or maybe in the United States. We have ha not heard yet from, uh, from the Association of International Education Administrators. The Professional Develop Development Program for English Teachers, PDPI, is part of the Brazilian government's strategic plan to improve English language teaching and teacher training in all states in, of Brazil. It's funded by CAPES, and administered by IIE and the Brazilian Fulbright Commission. The program was suspended last year, but hopefully it will take place in summer 2022. In summer 2019, IIE and 14 university partners welcomed nearly 500 Brazilian public school English teachers for a six-week program in the U.S. This year, CAPES and the Ministry of Foreign Relations offered an opportunity for US, US universities to participate in a lectureship program, Leitorado Brasileiro, in the spring semester 2022. Lecturers are university professors who are selected in Brazil through a public notice. The objective of the, prog the program is to promote Portuguese language and Brazilian culture. Lecturers are invited to work within the Department of Modern Languages, considering that Portuguese language courses are offered at the institution and there is interest and benefits can be offered to the lecturer. Portuguese language is a barrier for US students to study in Brazil. Hopefully, more students will choose Brazil for their experience abroad. The inclusion of Portuguese in the Critical Language Scholarship Program, sponsored by the U.S. Department of State Office of Global Educational Programs, USA Study Abroad Branch, may attract the students interested in Portuguese language and culture Im immersion. The embassy has recently promoted events in virtual books to introduce our language and culture to the world. Now some trends. Brazilian students are interested in joint degrees, LLM, business, and some innovative program, dual, dual high school diploma, as well as lingual, English language training. It is attractive to Brazilians who need English language skills to compete in the jobs market and to pursue study abroad. The trend will contribute to increasing the number of Brazilian students applying to US undergraduate programs. And now to keep you updated on the present 
of Education USA in Brazil. Education USA has 40, 40 advising centers in Brazil. One center open during the pandemic. Brazil has had a very strong presence in the 100,000 strong in the Americas. As of January 2020, there are 24 Innovation Fund grant awards to teams of 157 higher education institutions in the United States in Brazil. So thank you and I'll be more than glad to answer questions. Mira, the floor is all yours. Wonderful, thank you, Shaz. Uh, thank you for putting together this panel. It's a wonderful opportunity to, to talk about the challenges and best practices. So um, I can't agree more with my uh, pre speakers that the, the pandemic has been a real challenge uh, affecting change across every sector, uh, also for international education. One thing that has not changed, however, and I would like to stress this at this moment, is Germany's commitment to international education and exchange. Forging people-to-people -people connections through cultural and educational exchange is a top priority of the German federal government and a pillar of foreign policy. And to uh, differ from my, from my text right now, I have to say from personal experience, I came first as a high school student to spend one year in Illinois, and then I returned for another year on a Fulbright scholarship to uh, beautiful New Mexico uh, to focus on Native American studies. And if I had never done this, I think I wouldn't be sitting here as a German diplomat in, in beautiful uh, Washington, D.C. So I know from personal experience how, how important this international exchange is to uh, bring people together and, uh, and for our bilateral relations. Um, I would like to mention the German Academic Exchange Service at this moment, because with this, uh, what we call DAAD, we have, have a wonderful organization um, responsible for our um, secondary um, exchange programs. It was founded in 1925 is the world's largest organization funding the international exchange of students and scientists. Uh, since its founding, the DAD has supported 2.6 million scholars, both German and from across the world. The DAD's activities go beyond awarding scholarships and include making German universities more international, uh, strengthening German language studies abroad, advising decision makers in higher education. The DAAD's uh, um, uh, North American office is based in New York and is a very close partner of the German embassy and missions in the USA. Beyond the DAAD, some of the key institutions in German-American educational exchange are, of course, as you know, the German-American Fulbright Commission, um, the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation, and the German Bundestag with uh, the Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange and International Parliamentary Scholarship Program. And there are, uh, I would like to mention this, so many other organizations contributing to, to student exchange uh, that I cannot all mention here. Uh, for example, Rotary, Youth for Under Understanding, AFS, and so on. Um, so when the pandemic hit in, uh, in March 2020, our first challenge was to establish communication with uh, the diverse stakeholders in the international education landscape in a way that we had never done before. And in fact, we had to find out who is all involved in, in uh, international student exchange. Uh, our role was to share information and coordinate between exchange organizations, large and small, and individual participants and guardians, uh, the foreign ministries in the US and Germany and others. 
we were able to quickly establish contacts and provide information via a unified distribution list that was sent uh, a weekly update for over a year. In those first weeks, uh, de decisions were often made on a case-by-case -case basis um, based on diverse factors and threat assessment. Um, for the flagship German-American exchange program, uh, Congress Bundestag Youth Exchange, CBYX, uh, it was decided on March 12th to end the program for all participants. Uh, repatriation of both German and American CBYX fellows was completed within five days, thanks to the dedication of program staff and the administering organizations. The administering organizations on the US side then worked with the State Department colleagues to facilitate a relatively smooth transition under the unprecedented circumstances. The German embassy also contributed to this re-entry process, preparing an early days webinar presentation on how to stay connected to Germany and future exchange opportunities. One major problem of the pandemic have been, of course, the travel rich restrictions. Uh, uh, Marcy mentioned it already. Um, when the new US visa regulations in uh, July 2020 um, were put in place, uh, an online study program alone would not su suffice to receive an F1 or M1 visa. And those with, with such visas then participating in online study would lose their visas. So thousands of international students would be forced to leave the country. So we as embassy on July 10th received a letter from uh, the uh, Harvard stu German students at Harvard, written also on behalf of the uh, about 10,000 German university students in the USA, uh, protesting uh, against this regulation because, of course, they didn't want to go home. Following the protest and a court case by 17 states and over 200 institutions of higher education, the US government rescinded the regulation on July 14th, which made it uh, possible for the students to, to stay lucky. Um, one example of our support for um, fellowship programs uh, I would like to mention is, is the uh, Robert Bosch uh, Fellowship Program, one of our most prestigious programs. And um, when um, uh, the last uh, cohort of, of this program wanted to go to Germany um, in, in summer 2020, um, of course, we had uh, travel restrictions in place as well. So what we did was we or coordinated with uh, our, the foreign ministry in Berlin and with representatives of the Bosch Fellowship and Cultural Vistas. And we were able to negotiate the entry permission for the 14 participants of this final uh, program. Um, what has been mentioned before, and I, I would like to also stress, was the implementation of new digital teaching formats um, in international academic cooperation at German universities, which had already begun before the pandemic, was a major contribution to overcoming the pandemic crisis. From our perspective, it is important to note that the virtual and digital programs are not a replacement for traditional academic exchange, but are valuable and forward-looking complementary elements. The virtual and digital programs make it possible to maintain international academic exchange even during the pandemic. In addition, they help to reduce the amount of air travel required and thus contribute to the fight against climate change. Furthermore, the virtual and digital programs require fewer financial resources and are less time intensive and can thus also invite new target groups of students for academic exchange who have participated little in the past. Um, so I would like to mention uh, some, um, uh, some protocols to ensure students, uh, student health in Germany. Um, 
At the early stage of the pandemic, ensuring health safety required limiting all non-essential travel, including within the EU. With time, restrictions have been loosened where prudent, but entry to Germany remains prohibited from the so-called virus variant areas. And um, there are testing requirements from high incident areas. And I um, just heard some breaking uh, fantastic news today is that uh, Germany has decided uh, to adopt EU regulations um, uh, meaning that all travel from the US to Germany will be, uh, there will be no uh, pandemic cost restrictions anymore. So everybody will be able to travel again uh, to Germany um, starting um, as of this coming Sunday. So I'm, I'm very happy about this breaking news today. Um, when we look back, of course, um, there, there have been quarantine regulations um, of the um, German federal states. Uh, there has been the need to register. And uh, Germany has uh, most of all relied on widespread rapid testing to bolster public health safety. And um, we have, for example, a central line you can call to find out where your closest uh, testing possibility is. Um, the bottom line, I would say, is while the health and safety of all people in Germany, including students, remains top priority, Germany is striving to make in-person education and research a reality whenever possible. So I'm coming to, to the change in student numbers. Um, uh, um, due to the pandemic, as we hear from uh, the German Academic Exchange Service. Um, the situation of international academic exchange in Germany has proven to be fairly stable, even in times of the pandemic. German universities quickly switched to remote teaching in 2020 in the wake of the pandemic and also offered this to international students. This was also very helpful for the scholarship sector. In addition, the DAAD, in consultation with its funding sources, was able to quickly introduce very flexible scholarship regulations that allow for a combination of face-to-face -face and distance learning and the ability to react at short notice in each case and adjust the regulations depending on the local pandemic situation. The number of new enrollments of international students at German universities has in, uh, decreased, of course, but only, I have to say, by 21% uh, overall. So we went down from a number of 125,400 in the academic year of 2019-2020 to uh, still 99,400 in 2020 and 21 as a result of the pandemic. Um, I think I will leave it at that for the moment and I am looking forward to taking your questions. Thank you very much. But thank you very much to all our wonderful um, panelists. And I have to say, um, you know, hearing everybody's presentation, I really do come away with a with a with a positive feeling. Um, I think, um, you know, to Dr. Duterney's point, um, the 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 pandemic has provoked us, um, and it has pushed us to be innovative. And I think that we have actually become incredibly resilient. You know, how do you define resilience in, in 2021? Um, so I, I, I feel that um, those of us in the field of um, international education, I think we surprised ourselves um, by stepping up. Everybody worked so hard. Everybody stepped up to the plate. And, you know, I heard words in your presentations like seamless, um, quickly, and that, and that seems to be what has um, happened. Um, so I would like to, um, I'm going to go to the Q&A to give time um, for the panelists to answer questions. And um, 
The first question, I think, does go to um, the two institutions, uh, University of Pennsylvania and Rice University. Um, how are international students reacting to tuition costs while taking online classes from their home countries? And how did the university support them when dorms were asked to be closed? So I guess either Peter or Dr. Duterney or Dr. Leventer. Yeah, I mean, I can start, Peter, if, if that's okay. Um, so we did not have students um, questioning the, the tuition. In fact, um, you know, I think everyone realized it's not ideal for all students. Um, and I mentioned earlier the challenges that some of our students within the U.S., you know, who were uh, struggling with internet and, and other challenges, you know, face. So uh, I, I didn't see the international students having a particular set of questions around the tuition that was different from, um, you know, other other domestic students. I don't know, Peter, what you saw at Penn. Um, so, I mean, this was a, a question we saw yeah, both in the U.S. and, and abroad, but, um, you know, wondering about the value of, um, of online education and the costs of online education. Uh, the cost to universities to support students during the pandemic was, was enormous. Um, and uh, I'll just talk about one uh, small initiative, uh, which was um, we decided to hold classes or, or model classes for Penn parents. Um, and we had parents from, um, from, you know, from the U.S., from, from abroad in these classes. I actually did one in the, in the fall and I did one in the spring. And, uh, you know, this, it was really uh, rewarding to hear the parents afterwards say um, they had questions about online learning and actually being in a model classroom, they could see the value of it. And they were, uh, they really believed their, 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 their kids were learning. So, um, uh, so I mean, the, the, these were questions for everyone about the, the, the expense of, uh, of online learning. And, um, you know, hopefully students and, uh, and, and parents really appreciated, you know, how much effort and expense uh, and care went into it. Uh, I mean, again, this is, I've said this earlier, but this is one of the things I saw as um, one of the, the most heartwarming takeaways of the pandemic was just how much faculty and, uh, and the university generally, um, you know, cared about the learning experience and went to incredible lengths to, to make sure that it was done at a really high value. I would just add to that, we had an example of, um, uh, we had two exchange students who showed up for this, this spring semester and they came to say goodbye when they left and all our classes were, were online. And both of them, but in particular one, just raved about her experience with her professors. And so then we passed that information on to the professors. And it was such a, I, it, we were almost a little bit surprised, but she said, no, so much better than the classes she was getting in Barcelona in Spain, because she had a one-on-one -on -one with the professors. They, she felt reached out to. So that was that was interesting and that was all, all online. So I have another question here um, regarding, um, articles that claimed that online learning was the future and that students won't want to come to campus anymore. So for all of the, the presenters, what is your view on this topic? Will online learning replace in-person or be a complement? And if the complement, who is the target market for this complement, online learning? Sorry for such a long question, the uh, questionnaire says. Well, you know, our students want to get back to campus. They are itching to get back to campus. Um, that said, they really like being able to access courses online. And so I think, you know, students are going to want both. Um, now, you know, that, as, as Peter mentioned, you know, universities have, um, you know, really uh, spent a, a lot of resource on online education. I think it's going to be a question of what is the place of both and on campuses. It is expensive to do for sure. Um, but, you know, my everything we're seeing here is students can't wait to get on campus and they want to be able to access the asynchronous content ahead of class, after class, as a study aid. Uh, so I think here it's a both and. And I think that may, of course, for those of us who work with international students, that could cause a problem for us as far as what the SEVP, SEVP guidance will be on online education. Yeah. 
So another question, um, the pandemic has shown that there are many ways to participate in education internationally beyond traditional education abroad. This has many benefits. Um, as, as Ms. Boutin uh, mentioned, including making international experience more accessible post-pandemic for those who have historically been underrepresented. However, I wonder if any of you have concerns given generational preferences for virtual replacing reality that students may choose virtual over in-person education abroad. So um, Vera, I don't know if you'd like to take a stab at that. I first have to unmute myself. Yes, of course. Um, as I said, I think virtual um, formats can only be um, as a supplement can only be com complementary to 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 in person educational exchange and and we're really convinced that it's so important to have real life person to person exchange and context when you look at uh, german american relations um uh, there have been um, lots of GIs, for example, uh, posted to Germany for generations. And there have been so many exchange students, students from both sides going back and forth. And this is really the basis of, of, um, of our bilateral relations that have been really, um, really uh, strong and, and have endured uh, all the challenges of the past years. So we're really convinced it is very important, but nevertheless, um, I think we should all learn from uh, this digitization and profit from it. For example, if, when seminars, when webinars like these are possible also with participants from Germany or for, for, from Africa, from China, from all over the world, if you find a time that suits everyone, uh, this is just so easy now. And this makes international exchange even um, um, more diverse and, and more lively, I think. Thank you. Um, and I guess to follow up on a, on a study abroad question um, for Peter, in your programs, in which two to three week study abroad programs is tacked onto a regular semester course and how do you handle faculty salary for those additional two to three weeks? Um, so this was actually a, a program that came out of a study of, uh, of student engagement uh, globally across campus. And we have semester long, year long programs, summer programs, uh, but we hadn't been keeping track of all of the short-term uh, intensive experiences that were built into existing courses. Uh, and so once we realized that uh, it was a huge number of courses that were engaged in short-term you know, global, um, global experiences, we started to bring them together and, um, and uh, keep it a little bit more organized, but also create a lot of support for it. So now there's a tremendous amount of really exciting um, support for these for these programs and and funding to help make them happen uh, for students and faculty. Um, so faculty don't get additional um, uh, salary or stipends for this. Um, it's done in load as but um, but the the support is actually pretty incredible, and it just makes uh, these kinds of experiences happen in ways that would have been very difficult to to cobble together and fund and support with administrative help um, before that before. So, I have to say, there's a line of people um, trying to to apply to teach them. So. Right. Thank you. Um, and then also for the universities to answer, um, someone has put in a question asking about what um, is influencing, I guess, influencing decision making or, or, or preventing um, universities from fully opening to all students, as well as visitors, even though their states, for example, New York and Maryland, have discontinued um, all restrictions. Um, I think I'm assuming, I, I'm not sure I'm right, but I'm assuming that this is talking about COVID restrictions. That's what I think it may be as well, yeah. Yeah. Um, so, I, you know, I, I can speak for Rice um, because I know it well and I'm in those meetings and um, it's different for different institutions. We're a private institution. Um, we followed CDC guidelines from day one. Um, and, and for us, the real decision tree is around 
uh, what percentage of our campus population is fully vaccinated. Um, we can't require um, our members to give us that information, but we do have a series of surveys where we ask people uh, to provide information as they are comfortable doing so. For us, it was really about getting to um, you know, a vaccination percentage that would make the university a safe place to be. And it's really terrific, you know, we, um, we're on the semester system and so we had to make decisions ahead of time for summer. You know, we weren't fully vaccinated uh, in time to roll back decisions for online summer semester. So we're online, um, you know, in summer, um, but it's a, much, it's a much more open place now. You see, you know, visitors walking their dogs without masks. Um, so things are feeling like they're relaxing. And, you know, um, it's the benefit of, I think, everyone taking it really seriously. And um, so, you know, we're requiring vaccinations of students coming back in the fall. Um, with a few exceptions, but, uh, but you know, we're committed to that. And that was going to be my follow-up question, whether you, either of your institutions are requiring vaccinations to come back, or both both your institutions are. Uh, yeah, so we are requiring vaccinations. Um, it's, we're making uh, vaccinations available to any students uh, who want them when they come to campus. Um, and then, of course, there are, there are religious and health exceptions. Right. And in terms of staff and uh, faculty, um, you know, to to be in in good standing and compliance, uh, regulatory compliance, we uh, we respect people's privacy. Certainly, um, you know, if if people aren't vaccinated, we we of course you know come back to campus, but we have a, a, a testing protocols. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's going to be our next chapter when uh, August arrives, how things unfold. Um, so I'm trying to see if there's any other um, questions. We do still have um, some time for more um, questions. Um, I do have one that I'd like to pose to Dr. Lavender, um, and that's um, as a result of the pandemic and developments over the past year, um, how have your thoughts on equity in international education changed? Um, how do you approach making international education more accessible, more equitable? Um, are, are you speaking to students? Uh, yeah. yeah, that you know that has been a, a priority of the university before COVID too, mm -hmm. um, for sure. And uh, you know, so uh, for our students, it's an important principle, regardless of whether they are on financial aid or not that study abroad programs and opportunities are, are available. Um, and so we're, as I mentioned, a smaller institution, we tend to do that decision-making and that understanding of student need um, within local units, so within a department or a school. Um, and thus far we've been, I think, highly successful with that approach, um, you know, it's an ongoing challenge because, of course, you know, um, study abroad is expensive, um, and you know, not all students can can really afford it on their own. But you know, it's not just a money issue. Um, you know, a lot of students, you know, have never left the country, don't have a passport. Um, it really feels like uh, walking into an entirely other world. Um, and they might be the the first one from their family actually to ever you know consider uh, a, a you know a study trip to Costa Rica or um, you know we have a global health initiative in Africa right um, and so a lot of uh, the equity work comes from actually educating an extended family um, I think that's going to be ever more challenging now that COVID has made the world even feel like a scarier place. Um, but it's really an important piece of an undergraduate experience. I mean, we are a global community and, um, you know, for students to leave Rice without having some kind of experience beyond uh, Houston or the U.S., I think is doing them a disservice. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. I was talking just to follow up. I was yeah, talking to our absolutely. global affairs yeah. office uh, last week and um, they said the thing that really changes politicians' minds are stories about uh, about campus, much more so than than demographics or, or trends. Uh, so I've, I've actually led a number of study abroad programs 
um, in London three times, in France, in China, uh, twice in Africa, uh, once in, uh, in Myanmar. And um, uh, it's right for you when I teach them during the year, students who are uh, who have are fully aided will can study abroad and their financial aid will cover it. For many of them, as Carolyn is saying, uh, they've never left the country. Uh, and it's a truly transformative experience for them um, and one that they have because it's encouraged by the university and um, and because they want to take advantage of the of the of the financial aid to have a broader global experience uh, and really they come back changed uh, just thinking of one student I just heard from recently um, who um, students applied to go to uh, to Kenya with me where we studied in a refugee camp and and uh, collaborated with refugees. She had ne and her application just said, "I've never left the country. That's the main reason I want to leave," and uh, and that was a compelling reason for me. And uh, she's just finishing law school and is going to be an immigration lawyer. And I know it, you know, the kind of the root of that uh, desire came from that trip. That's great. And I mean, it's it's going to be interesting, you know, to see what happens this fall with with our international students coming um, this way. Also, with our American students, at least at least what I've heard from our study abroad at, at Catholic University is that there's still quite a bit of hesitancy from the domestic student population to go on and um, a study abroad program at this point. But at the same time, on the flip side, we have one of the largest groups of our J1 exchange students um, who are wanting to come this fall. So I think there's a lot of desire from, from everybody that we still really want to travel. We want to be in person. And um, I mean, again, I think the, the, the pandemic has, has pushed us in, into being innovative, uh, as you said. And um, it's maybe we're just all going to come out just better than before, which we would never have imagined. Um, <laughs> not to gloss over all the challenges that we have all gone gone through. Mm -hmm. so. I guess okay. I have a, a question, follow-up question for our embassy colleagues. Um, what facilities are you providing your national, um, your citizens to make sure that they make their enrolled dates um, in the U.S., uh, are you chartering flights to bring them over, or I don't know what perspective um, uh, you want to talk about? But uh, what support are embassies giving their citizens? Excuse me, the connection was somehow bad. I didn't really get your question. Your question was in, in how far we are supporting our students coming here for exchange programs. Students and scholars, how, how are you facilitating their um, transfer from home country to U.S. universities, making sure they meet their deadline, uh, their enrollment deadlines, and they the mm -hmm. for you know on campus classes. Uh, um, should I start, Marcy? Yeah, um, go ahead, Vera. And then because yeah. I'm not, Marcy is much more professional to answer that question as I'm a little bit out of that uh, field. But yeah. uh, <laughs> from own personal experience, uh, nobody's helping because young adults have to find their own way. So um, I booked my flight. I took the plane, I arrived, and then I went to my university. I looked for an apartment and I found some roommates. And then um, my first uh, contact with any help was the international students office in um, at the University of Albuquerque. And I was very grateful for that, that uh, universities have those international student offices because they could give me a lot of advice. But other than that, uh, the government doesn't um, interfere with booking any flights or <laughs> taking care of that. I don't know, Marcy, is that your experience as well? Well, in the beginning of the pandemic, um, there were flights to Brazil, despite restrictions for Brazilian citizens to enter the U.S. So, no, the, the government uh, didn't provide flights because there were flights and actually citizens could quarantine in other countries. And some students, some citizens were doing that. They were flying, for example, to Mexico before they would come but to, of course, quarantine before they would enter uh, the U.S. And um, and now, you know, the restrictions um, were lifted up a little bit. Um, um, just the flights continue. The flights actually, I think, almost returned to normal as far as I know. So, no, the government uh, does not uh, provide flights. Um, so students come and, and they're in 
just complementing what Goodrum said and some of you also said too, that um, students are really eager to come back. Parents are actually is still contacting, you know, the embassy with some questions um, because they want to come back. They are really, they really want to be here in person. So yeah, so that's hopefully it's going to happen soon. And I would imagine that for for the two embassies, I mean, your hands are really tied as far as facilitating getting the students here because they they are all subject to Department of Homeland Security and their regulations for actually being admitted into um, coming to the United States. That's right. That's exactly right. So um, yeah, that was the reason why we we received because I think that uh, and also student associations in the U.S. Uh, but, but the students were in Brazil, they left. So they were coming to the embassy just to express their desire that, uh, of course, they want to come back. If it, but consulates in the embassy in Brasilia, they were, you know, just stopped activities. But uh, yeah, so it was just kind of nurturing students and talk about resilience, talk about, uh, you know, just being just patient as, as soon as the um, um, consulates uh, in uh, US consulates in Brazil resume some activities, of course, emergency situations were taken care of, but not F1 students or J1 students. Mm -hmm. So, but now um, things are, are just a little better because like I mentioned in my presentation uh, in April 26, the U.S. Department applied um, several national interest exceptions to travel rest restrictions. So the students are being able to come back and some already just with no action from the embassy or consulates in Brazil. That's great. Yeah, and that's great. great. May I add uh, just a little aspect? Um, as as Marcy said, uh, flights are not the problem. Uh, you mm -hmm. can just book flights. But what mm -hmm. what the problem uh, in part is, and that uh, from from our experience, uh, students are not that affected. But when it comes to teacher exchange, for example, it's it's really hard for teachers or for, for any other persons that could, in theory, apply for a visa to come here uh, to the U.S., uh, but who have problems getting an appointment at uh, U.S. Uh, embassy or consulates in Germany because, of course, they have a huge backlog of uh, um, applications that they have to uh, work on. And so we're in, in constant contact with uh, our wonderful colleagues uh, in the State Department and also at the U.S. Embassy and, and consulates in Germany to facilitate uh, getting uh, those uh, people an appointment. Yeah, that is, that's going to be the biggest challenge, I think, for our fall um, students coming in. And I have uh, one, another question um, for the universities on the panel regarding study abroad. How has your process for giving the go-ahead for fall semester study abroad programs changed um, in light of the pandemic? Well, um, so what we have done in the pandemic, you know, we, we stopped all international travel. Um, really, this summer is the first time we even, even started some kind of quasi-approval process for summer study abroad. Um, and at the undergraduate level, um, you know, it's, it's, not, it's not very active, quite frankly. Um, at the graduate student level, I guess research abroad is happening um, as, as feasible. Um, I think going forward, it's a really great question. Um, you know, we'll definitely continue our, you know, SOS, our travel, international travel, uh, you know, program of understanding where people are. I think the principle of, you know, if the country is, uh, you know, looks safe uh, in every way for travel. We generally approve those. Um, I think it's going to depend on what the pandemic does, quite frankly. Yeah, I know that's that's true for us as well, um, for the most part. Um, I, but as Carol was saying earlier, um, you know, decisions have to be made far in advance, and so um, all of our on all of our summer programs uh, are, are online this this summer, and study abroad is uh, is basically canceled. There is, of course, research going on and we're slow, those, these policies are slowly opening up. 
Um, and we actually have a, a kind of graduated plan so that um, everything is, is resuming uh, to normal. But um, you know, this, these decisions are being made on a country by country basis. Things are, are very fluid. Uh, are, are both of your universities offering study abroad programs for fall? Yeah, we are. Um, our, our most popular study abroad tends to not be a full semester, but um, sort of targeted immersions that happen kind of, you know, at the end of a semester, as Peter mentioned, or um, kind of, you know, in a week spring break, some, something like that. Um, but yes, we, we do plan to do that. And just to underscore what Peter said, you know, we had a kind of frustrating situation in that we have a center in Paris and, um, you know, of course, France just, you know, opened up very recently and I had to, you know, stop a wonderful, um, you know, group of 35 students this summer who had planned and wanted to go to the Paris Center. They needed to make other plans for summer, and so they needed a go or no go decision. You know, back in April, basically. Yeah. So, um, is you know, it, it's it's frustrating. We just couldn't commit to that in April, and you know, um, there there you are. But hopefully soon we'll be able to get back to normal. Yeah. So well, I think on that sentence, hopefully soon we can get back to normal. Um, I, I'm going to turn it back over to Shaz. Um, but it's thank you so much. This was wonderful. Um, Peter, Carolyn, Vera, Marcy, Gudrun, thanks a lot. Um, the Embassy Dialogue Committee uh, is a NAFSA member interest group, and we, we facilitate uh, discussions and educational panels between embassy representatives and uh, U.S. higher education community. So this has been very interesting uh, discussion. We really appreciate it. We are having, uh, we've made a recording of this panel. We will be sharing that. Um, and we look forward to uh, the fall forum where we're gonna have one more forum. And uh, for our attendees, please feel free to volunteer to serve uh, in any capacity with, uh, with EDC. And I thank my uh, NAFSA colleagues for logging in and also uh, joining us today. So thank you so much, it's been wonderful discussion and uh, look forward to working with you all in the future again.